Oh, because I can read only so they can, you know, grab data, and whatever. Mm -hmm. The website can only read, the back end can write. Yes, exactly, for example. Yeah. <clears throat> and what I really like and what I encourage everyone to do is not to write SQL for your application. Write functions that your application invokes and put the SQL in the functions. Because then if you have to change your tables or redesign them, you can just change your function and you don't have to change your application at all. Tips for pro young players, okay, do it that way. Don't write SQL on your app. That's sure, you can say. That's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, no, I mean, like, that's, that seems like very practical, practical advice where you could have another layer of abstraction there so that, like, yes. this is the feature I need. I don't care how it works underneath. Yes. Make, just make sure it works. And it's very low cost, too, because instead of saying select star from table where this equals that, you say select star from function. Or right. select function bracket parameters, close bracket. And then if things change and you have to add in more parameters, you can say load ones have default values like this. Yes, it provides ways to, to migrate to the future without having a bunch of breaking changes. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That's very good advice. Um, and then it also means that, that the, you, you can do a lot of changes in the back end and never have to reissue a new app. Because if you say, oh, I want to add in this other table, oh, how am I going to do that? i got to get a new app. But no, if all you've done is, is, is changed how you do things and nothing that is presented in the app has changed, do it all in the back end. You'll have a much better time. Um, so functions, create databases. Mm, I can't remember what the other thing I was thinking of. The, the best advice I have, though, is when you're, when you're doing this, Figure out the easiest way for you to do a backup and do that backup religiously because one day you are going to wind up deleting data that you did not intend to delete and you're going to do it from the command line. Get into the habit of saying begin, semicolon, enter. That does a transaction. Then even if all you're doing is reading, you can select the stuff that you want and look at it. But if you're doing any sort of updating, do your select first, look at the data you're about to change, then issue the modification command, then look at the data again and see if it looks like what you wanted to do. Then if you're confident, issue the commit because sooner or later you're going to accidentally delete a whole bunch of data. Yes. Better still, create a user that you connect as that has read-only permissions and do your queries that way. Then there's no chance that you're going to accidentally delete stuff. I think that's a really, that's a really good advice. Actually, transactions are huge, especially if you have you know a web app or anything where you have concurrent access to the database and you really need to make sure that you have you know, consistent state changes. Um, also, one thing I really liked about Postgres is just like, it makes it super easy. You know, if I would have like I have these read-only users and I just want to make sure that they only have this many connections and they can only last this long and those kinds of things so you don't have users who are just you know select star from giant table all the time. Yeah. Now, there's something called a pghba.conf file, which is the host-based authentication. So you can set restrictions on incoming connections. It's right. sort of like a firewall, but not exactly. Like this user can only come from these hosts or only local right. host or right. whatever. Yeah, so I've used that before, yeah. You can have a host or a network and a database name uh, and the type of connection they're allowed to use. So like from local host, you can connect in. You don't have to use SSL on local host. But this user, if they're coming in from that host, they must use SSL. Yes. Or like, way. if you do have some things that you know, like, okay, well, this user is the backup user. He can see the whole database, but he can only off from that one host over there where we take the backup. Yep, exactly. So you can do all that, that sort of stuff in pghba. Um, I one of the great things I like doing is using PHP with Postgres, believe it or not. And a lot I know people have there are some people out there that have a very bad uh, uh, feeling about PHP, but I use it every day. Anyway, that's that's my story, I'm sticking to it. <laughs> now um I think that's about it. There was something that I thought of. You were talking about granting access. That's about all I wanted to cover on Postgres today because there's just so much to cover. This great documentation. You, you go into the website and you look for the command you're looking for and you can say, okay, well, that's a documentation for 9.2. What about the documentation for 9.3? Is it the same? And you can just click back and forth between the same pages in the document for the different versions. It's a great feature. I wish more documents had that. Yeah, no, I think, I think you're totally right about that. Any, uh, anything you want to point people to? Uh, oh, go on. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just saying, is anything you want to point people to for good learning resources or, or anything else? Um, the Postgres website has really great documentation. There's a conference coming up. <laughs> it's my conference. I run the conference. Oh, PGCon yeah. PG comes up next month. PGCon.org. Go and have a look. Um, it's in Ottawa in May, the week of May 23rd, I believe. I also think um, Postgres is a great thing, like, it's used by a lot of companies, corporations, open source projects, so you're all interested in things, or you're left out, or back end, or anything like that. Postgres is a huge selection of tech people. There's uh, IRC channels. They're very useful. The mailing lists are great. The documentation is very good. Um, one last tip. Uh, I'm about to set up a, a server, and the Postgres database will go in its own FreeBSD jail. Uh, I'll do that so just so that it's in a separate container. But then if I go to upgrade, I can install Postgres in another jail and dump it from there, load it up in the other one, get it all ready to go, and then just go, boom, swap swap over from one to the other. And it's just a configuration change in the web app to say, don't talk to that host anymore, talk to this host over here, and, and you're done. Um, I'm looking forward to that because I've done it once on another server, and I really liked it. It was so much easier. So do you, um, just some follow-up questions, uh, do you have a bunch of experience with like, stuff like uh, PG Pool or other things for managing user connections? And I'm also interested in, like, have you, do, you, do you do much for like, replication or you know, um, primary, secondary kinds of stops? I did play around with Sloney for a little while. Right, yeah, Sloney, yeah. Um, but I, I have not bothered setting up any replication for Postgres or any, for um, fresh ports or anything like that. It's always, I've always just felt it's easier just to maintain one website and have it going. Right. And if you have backups, then yeah. you should be fine. I've got backups that back up every day. And um, the data that goes into it comes from our mailing list, so I can always get that data uh, again. Yeah, right. uh, people will lose whatever changes they did that one day. But yeah, I could replicate to another location easily enough and just have it up to date all the time. I could replicate to another location on the same box and then replicate to somewhere else. But it would still take a long time to copy that data over. Um, I haven't played around with wall log. Uh, um, wall is a write-ahead log. Uh, I haven't played around with um, log shipping, which is basically you have two databases. Uh, as you update one database, you write to a log of what you did, and then you ship that log off to another server and then execute that log on the other server so that you have the same thing going on, only one is slightly delayed. And that can sometimes be useful because if, if something happens and somebody deletes all your data, your other server is about half an hour behind, and you can stop it and then just play everything up until the point of where the, before the data was deleted, and you're back to where you were. That's a great point. All right, anything else you'd like to add about Postgres or anything people to do? Use Postgres, not MySQL.
You, hear, you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> uh, all right, so with that, I think that brings us to our last sponsor this evening. That's our friends over at DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean, ah, they're the simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and the easiest way to spin up a brand new cloud server in under 55 seconds. Whether you want FreeBSD, any of the very popular Linux distributions, or, you know, maybe you want OpenBSD or Arch Linux or something else that you know, requires a real KDM hypervisor to go, DigitalOcean is the easiest by far, quickest place to get that started. You know, whether you want your building a new kernel, you need a CI box, you just want a box to test something and throw it away, or you need a server for your Quasal instance, or for your personal blog, or as a backup server where you can, you know, do black backups. DigitalOcean makes it so easy. Go to DigitalOcean.com, use our promo code, SNAPOcean, that, my friends, will get you $10 in service credit. You know, and uh, the droplets start at $5 a month. Yeah, that's right, $5 a month. You get 5, 12 MB of RAM, 20 gigs of SSD disk, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. That's right, 40 gigabyte E, right to the hypervisor. This is real bandwidth here, people. Not something that, like, well, it's a terabyte, but you'll never get there because we cap you like 50 megs. Haha. No, DigitalOcean takes it seriously. They have beautiful data centers. If you go follow them on social media, you'll see that they take, they, you know, they take their infrastructure seriously. They have a lot of very talented people working for them. They have data center locations all over the world New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, London, Frankfurt, and Toronto. So pretty much wherever you need, you can find the DigitalOcean thing. They've got the OSs you need. They've got the features you need. They've got a lot of things to compete with, you know, compete with any of the other cloud providers. They've got monitoring, load balancing. They've got, you know, block storage. Pretty much whatever size you can need is all backed by SSDs. They've got private networking. They've got snapshots. Plus, they have a great API that they think of their site. They use the API. Their app they use the API. Any of the other apps or open source, command line utilities or websites or anything else, they all use this great, simple API. Plus, we were just talking about Postgres, right? But one of the huge things about DigitalOcean is their community, right? Right there, you see it right on top of the page. Community. They have awesome docs made by community members, but DigitalOcean hires real editors to make sure that these docs are consistent, up to date, and top notch quality. So, look at this. They've got like, a whole bunch of Postgres tutorials. How to secure Postgres against automated attacks. How to set up a Django project with Postgres, Nginx, and G Unicorn on Debian 8. So, these are all popular. Some of the first things you'll see if you Google DigitalOcean. And I think that, that really goes to show that DigitalOcean understands the market, they understand their users, and they understand open source and, and the projects that are important there. Right? I mean, they pay authors $100 to $200 for technical tutorials. So, you know, if you like DigitalOcean, if DigitalOcean enables you to do the projects that you want, you can go contribute. You can help make it a better community for everyone else. Go to DigitalOcean.com, use our promo code SNAPOcean, get started. I mean, at $5 a month, that $10 promo code, I mean, that's like two months for free. If you're anything like me, that'll get you started. Then you'll be hooked, and uh, we'll have like five DigitalOcean servers running this day. So, thank you, DigitalOcean, for sponsoring the TechBet XBet program. Our promo code is DO Unplugged. Oh, but, but that's the other show. It's SNAPOcean. Either way, support the Jupiter Broadcasting Network. Go to DigitalOcean.com, and thank you to DigitalOcean. <laughs> And that brings us to this week's feedback, the section of our show where we get to hear from you, our wonderful audience members. What, what kind of magical feedback do you have for us this week, Dan? Well, as I mentioned earlier on in the show, we got more feedback. Did we say it live or did we say it off air? We basically got more feedback in the past week than we have in any other week, and I was impressed by that. Um, that makes me very happy. That's what, thank you, audience. Do you remember the um, last week a guy wrote in asking about this free DNS service? And right. he sort of said, is, is he writing in because he wants a free ad? Turns out, no, he had stumbled across and he wanted to know what he thought about it. He <laughs> wrote in again. That makes sense. I, well, I, I, I believe in that. Yes, it really helps to have that narrative. And, you know, like, instead of a one off, it becomes an interaction between us and you guys. And that's, that's really what we want. No, it isn't. Oh, sorry, yes. Yes, 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 yes it is. Right, you're right. Sorry, I forgot I was still on it. Um, and there's a lot of requests for deep dives. I think people like the deep dives. And I spoke with Alan about that. He said, yeah, the, he, he always enjoyed doing it and always got a lot of feedback on it, positive feedback. Awesome. So some people enjoy one part, some people enjoy the other part. Yeah. We'll, try, we'll try to mix it up you know, so that it's palatable to everyone. But I, I do agree, and I think, you know, in-depth technical coverage, um, something that you might only otherwise see at like a conference or other event, you know, where really, you, know, you have more than 20 minutes or 20 minutes, or something where you really you know, get into the details, really understand something. That's, that's rare and hard to find sometimes. And, and I don't think we went very deep on Postgres. So it was just very, right. very brief. And so we'll, we'll see what the feedback is on that. Like, yes. if there's a particular aspect of what you're trying to do, let us know. Same with Bacula or FreeBSC gels or something like that. But, um, it's best not to get too specific to your situation because then it, it, it's more of a feedback thing rather than going in on a deep dive. That's a very good point, yeah. All right, so uh, should we start with, uh, start with this feedback then? Yes. Excellent. Okay, so... First up, let's see here. Christopher is writing to us about building a PFSense box. Hey guys, I love everything you guys put out at Jupyter Broadcasting. Ah, uh, thank you, Christopher. I'm currently using an ISP provided modem slash router combination, and I'm tired of its minimized settings and would like to run my own router. The only issue is that I don't have a whole lot of spending money, so I was considering picking up an old junker from somewhere, adding a second pick, and loading PFSense onto it. What do you think will be the pros and cons of doing this? The first thing is make sure you can do that. Um, I'm not sure what he means by a router because sometimes the router is a thing that has a coax plugged into it, and if you're like me, my my ISP supplied router.
Oh, I'm gonna have to turn this off.